on the topic of the day. Um, you've served in the Whip's office. You know the information uh, that a Whip's office generally holds about the behaviour of the backbenches, allegations of drug abuse, of, of inappropriate behaviour. If the Conservative Whip's office currently holds information on its members along those lines right now, it should be put into the public domain or, or given to the relevant authorities, surely? Well, Neil, I think it depends on the severity of uh, the offence or the activity. Um, in some cases, some of this recently reported activity is obviously totally inappropriate, but the individuals concerned have apologised. But there might be, for all I know, offences which are more serious, in which case perhaps the Whip's office should take it further. Uh, but just in terms of the, the severity of the offence, let's try and work out where we are on a sliding scale. You know, improper language, I'll just keep it to ourselves. A bit of a grope, that's fine. But, you know, actual sexual assault, of course, we'd report that. Well, we're seeing this right across a whole area of activity, not just the Harvey Weinstein reports, but that we have reports today that the, in the theatre and other areas of public entertainment and photographers behaving badly... Um, I think it's obviously incumbent on members of parliament to behave uh, properly. But as I said, there are certain areas where I think an admission of guilt and a full public apology is right. But if the whips are privy to much more serious uh, allegations where an offence, actual legal offence might have been called, perhaps they then have to take it further. Uh, of course, it's, it's not just uh, former members of the Cabinet backbenchers. I mean, yesterday we had the Environment Secretary in the process of making a rather ill-judged joke appearing to suggest... Uh, that women who are the victims of sexual abuse had in some way lost some of their dignity? Um, yes, I, well, I was listening live to that Today broadcast. Um, uh, you could say the whole audience at the Wigmore Hall was to blame because they all, they all roared with laughter, uh, as did Lord Kinnock. Did you? Uh, but Michael Gove has subsequently, subsequently... Yes, but this is all a question of judgment, isn't it? Michael Gove has quite rightly, I think, very rapidly and full, given a fulsome apology for a statement which I think at the time was... I, my person I thought at the time was wrong, and he's been quite right about that. But a law has not been broken, and he's quite rightly come out and apologised very quickly in a fulsome manner. But I think it was worth noting... I'm making I mean, sorry, a, Mr Patterson, know, the it, point appears, is, it appears that you were just suggesting the, the that unless, audience, unless, a, the unless a law has been broken, you know, an apology is sufficient. Well, Neil, this is all a, a, obviously a very grey area. It depends on the severity of of what you're talking about. And we're talking about hypothetical events which I can't really comment on until we know the exact detail. But I'd have thought a very crude rule is that if a person is found to have behaved inappropriately, inappropriate language or something like that, uh, and it does Apollo admit... First of all, it's very important to admit that wrong has been done and then apologises, in my opinion, that should probably bring an end to it. But, as I said, you're asking me, you're, you're, you're hinting that the whips are privy to knowledge of much worse offences, uh, which I don't know about. Uh, if those are actually uh, illegal, then I think it would be appropriate to go further to higher authorities and ultimately the police. We'll be uh, speaking to um, Philip Dunn a little later in the programme. We'll, we'll, we'll put that point to him. But, but whilst we have you, of course, you're, you're, you're known as something of a Brexiteer, I think it's fair to say. Um, your colleague Charlie Elphick is asking the Treasury for, for a billion pounds to prepare now... Uh, for a no-deal Brexit. I mean, shouldn't we be starting to spend o on the infrastructure that we'll require if we do crash out of the European Union without a deal? Well, I think all this sort of no-deal and crash-out is all rather dramatic talk. I, I was a signature to a, to a letter with some very senior people two weeks ago saying that given the European Union's flat refusal to negotiate the end commercial relationship, it would be sensible to tell them formally that we assume from now, that was middle of November, sort of middle of October, that we will be moving to WTO rule terms uh, from the 30th of March uh, 2019. Should they then come back to us and want to talk about an all-encompassing free trade deal, that would be great. But as Charlie quite rightly said in your clip, it, this would be prudent insurance. Mm. And it would I mean, give clarity to all parties. Just, just let me finish. Quite important point. It would give clarity to all, all parties, not just those who use these facilities, but those who deliver them. So, for instance, customers and excise would know that they should be gearing up for this eventuality. 
And we should be invest, as Charlie says. Anyway, we should be investing this stuff. We should have an absolute world class. No, that, 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 that's, system, a, that, that, world class that's a that's a slightly separate system. point. I just and we, we, I just want to push no, it's you on not. one point. It's though. Not. You know, David David Davis this week landed himself in some in, in, in some hot water when he suggested that yes, the Commons will have a vote uh, on whatever we agree or don't agree with with the uh, European Union, but that vote might take place after the point at which we leave the European Union. I mean, that is a statement of fact, isn't it? If the negotiations go up to the wire, even beyond the wire, as Mr Davis said to the Select Committee, the only opportunity for the Commons to vote will be after we've left the European Union. Which is why it would be very prudent now to give them notice that we are assuming that the way the talks are being conducted, and they've said now we're going we're to miss the whole of November, we're not going to talk about trade unless they graciously concede it in the middle of December, so we'll miss most of December. We won't start talking then until January. That's effectively, from the moment we sent our letter last week, that's three months. We should be getting on with this now, as Charlie says. If they then get the signal, because they are the ones that have this huge 71.8 billion surplus with us, and they're the ones who will get clobbered by tariffs should we impose tariffs, then hopefully they'll come back to us and realise that the really big issue to talk about is our future trading relationship. But and that in, would be great. But we just all in want, terms of Commons oversight of this process... Hang on. And just in terms yeah, of Commons oversight of this want, process, from what you're saying, okay. you seem to agree with Mr Davis that, despite being promised from the very beginning that the Commons would have a vote of significance on this, the vote may take place past the point at which it would have any significance. Well, I think David Cameron and, and I think the government think that's unlikely. And they, they uh, say that the talks are actually going uh, better than the public image is, and they are confident they will get a deal. But the point about triggering the WTO issue now, this is not jumping off a cliff. This is not some mad, crazy overreaction to the fact that the talks haven't started. It is just being very prudent, as Charlie Elphick says, that we should ha take out an insurance policy. That will give clarity to all our administrators. It will give clarity to all business. For instance, if you take the issue of authorised economic oper operators, these, these are uh, trucking organisations that have basically a pass to a swift process. Uh, we've only got 604 of those. Germany has over 6,000. So if we triggered this, trucking companies could prudently start uh, lodging bids to take on authorised economic operator status. And that would speed things up with the customs down the road. Indeed Should the European Union come back and see that we're serious about this, that would be great, because what we all want, really, is reciprocal free trade with no tariffs. That's the ideal.